Do you remember where you were when 9-11 happened? I remember quite clearly um, just the week before, like literally seven days before, uh, I had flown home from France and I was at the house where I shared, uh, you know, I, I shared this house with a bunch of guys for university and one of them called me into his room and said, hey, look at what's happening on TV. A plane just flew into the World Trade Center and I thought, how on earth could a plane fly into the World Trade Center? That just didn't make any sense. But as you know, a plane did fly into the World Trade Center. And then another one, and then a plane hit the Pentagon and, and everything changed. All of a sudden, flying changed, international relations changed, and, and the world seemed to become a more dangerous place. It was a, a tragic, game-changing day for our generation. Genesis 3 is kind of the Bible's 9-11 moment. The moment when tragedy struck, where everything changed, where paradise became chaos and, and innocence gave way to the realities of the world. And the repercussions of Genesis 3 are still being felt today. Genesis 3 explains why stuff like 9-11 happened, why rape happens on campus and in other places, why people hack into your Facebook account and try to steal money from you. Genesis 3 explains how it is that there is sin in the world. And so if we're going to talk about how it started... Then, then we need to talk about Genesis 3. So join me in Genesis 3. Uh, Genesis 3, we are going to look at what is known in theological circles as, as the fall, the capital F, fall. Now, as, um, as Genesis 3 opens, it's, uh, it, it's, it's all's well in paradise, right? Adam and Eve are getting along famously. They are working and keeping the garden. They are taking care of all of creation, and God is providing everything that they need. Right? Eden literally means luxury, abundance. And so the people of God, Adam and Eve, are living in the lap of luxury. God has given them everything that they need. Life is good in paradise. But then along comes this serpent. And according to verse 1, the serpent was, was more crafty than any of the other wild animals that the Lord God had made. So note that the Lord God made this serpent. This is not an alien um, entity that has appeared in the garden. God made it. The serpent is therefore accountable to God. The snake, though, comes up to the woman and said, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden. Now, admittedly, it's a little odd that the serpent talks, um, <laughs> but when you read ahead into Revelation and, and see that uh, Satan is called that old serpent, then we realize that even though God created that snake, this is Satan who is speaking through it. And Satan is trying to disrupt the perfect relationship between God and man. And so what does he do? He calls into question God's goodness. Did God really say you ought not eat from any tree in the garden? Well, let's check. Flip back a page or up the page. Genesis 2.16, what does it say? The Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. I mean, that's the exact opposite of what the snake has said, right? The people in the garden are free to eat from any tree they want, just not the tree with the fruit of good and evil. But the snake here wants to sow doubt in their minds about God's goodness. So he implies that, that God is being stingy in his provision. He wants the people to say, wait, what, what did God say? Does he really care about us? Is he holding something back from us? And, and ultimately, what is it, um, should we listen to him? Eve doesn't quite take the bait. She does say, we may eat from the fruit of the, uh, the trees in the garden, but, but God did say, you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. She did add the touch it part. 
You will surely not die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will know, excuse me, you will be like God, knowing good and, and evil. At this point, Eve has a choice. She and Adam have been made to work and to keep the garden, literally to guard the garden. And so the first thing that she should do when she hears someone questioning the goodness of God is to throw that thing out of the garden, right? Adam and Eve are um, in charge. They are sovereign. They are to rule over everything that God has created. And so at the first hint of, of insurrection here, out the door, the snake should have gone. Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve already knew good and evil, right? They say, don't eat the fruit of the tree of good and evil, but they knew good and evil. They knew that what God said was good was good, and what God said was evil was not. And so they should have sent that snake packing right away. But, this, the, the, but Eve let the serpent's lure undermine her commitment to God. Right? She, she listened to a fellow created being, the snake, instead of listening to the God who, who had created them both. Instead of focusing on what God had done for them, the, the provision that they had morning after morning, the, the fellowship that they had with God walking with him, instead of focusing on all of those things, she instead began to entertain doubts about the goodness of, of God. She started to think that maybe she knew better than God what was good and evil. And so she took a look at the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. In verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And both of their eyes were opened, and they realized they were naked, and so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And in that instant, the relationship between God and man was, was forever changed. You know, sometimes in uh, television or movies, there'll be a voiceover that comes in and explains what's happening in that very moment. Romans 12 is the voiceover for this moment. In that moment, sin and death entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all men, because all have sinned. This is where it all began. Sin and suffering and pain and death are all a part of life, because Adam and Eve put their own will before God's. Not just that they eat the fruit, but that they reject the will of, of their creator, right? Eating the fruit is just the outward expression of the inner disposition of their hearts, and the inner, disp inner disposition of their hearts was away from God. They decided that, that they knew better than God what was good and what was evil. They decided to rely on themselves instead of God, and as a result, they fell. Sin entered the world, and everything changed. Verse 8 tells us what happened next. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, Where are you? Of course he knows where, God, uh, where the man is, right? This is God just calling Adam to account for himself. And he answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I've hid. You can imagine God saying, you've never hid before, Adam. That's kind of a weird thing to do, to hide from your creator who sees all things. Verse 11, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? What would you say in that moment? Fess up, admit your sin? Very first sin in history, and Adam tries to pass the buck. <laughs> Verse 12, the man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit of the tree, and I ate it. 
it's not my fault. It's the woman's fault. And you know what? You gave me the woman, so it must be your fault, God. Already, the harmony of the garden is falling apart, right? The relationship between God and man, broken. The relationship between husband and wife, broken. It's her fault. It's your fault. Eve is a better man than Adam is. <laughs> At least she mans up and owns it. Verse 13, the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me. Right? I mean, she has the guts to admit she was wrong. So the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed above all the livestock and all the wild animals, cursed you are above all of those things. You will crawl on your belly and eat dust the rest of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between her offspring and yours. He will crush your head, but you will strike his heel. Now, now historically, um, this is called the proto-evangelion, the proto-good news, um, because we get here hints of what God is going to do to remedy this situation. Um, just put that on the back burner for a second. So the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Um, before the fall, Adam and Eve got along fine, right? They thought of each other as, as equals. They did what they could to help one another. But now that unity has become broken. The, the you will desire him and he will rule over you. The implication is the wife is going to try to manipulate him and get him to do what she wants him to do. And the husband is going to try and rule over her as a tyrant. That's not the way it should be. And it ta <laughs> but it takes work to get away from that, doesn't it? Sin, though, has made this rift possible. And verse 17, to Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat the fruit of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat, um, uh, you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. You know, joy to the world. Uh, the third verse. No more let sin and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. Um, he comes to make his blessings known. Far as the curse is found. That's this, right? Joy to the world points to this and says... You know what? There is this curse now across the world that, that, that turns work from, from something that is meaningful and, and, and enjoyable to something that is a struggle and, and toilsome. Uh, no more would the ground freely give up its crops, but instead Adam is going to have to, Adam and Eve for that part, are going to have to work hard to get a living from the land, right? Goodbye, par goodbye paradise, hello, elbow grease. This is about as low as it gets for humanity. But even in the midst of this tragedy, the, there is hope. Right? There are hints here that even though the people have turned their backs on God, God is way more gracious than they would have expected. And he is already working to, to redeem his people. I mean, verse 7, Adam and Eve clothed themselves with like sewn up fig leaves. Uh, but as he prepares to send them out, verse 21, God says, that's Fig leaves aren't going to keep you warm. So he gives them leather clothing, right, to go out into the world. And, and then there's the, the proto-evangelion, right? In the, in, the, in the heat of judgment, God says to the snake, verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Um, Genesis 3.15 means that this snake is more than a snake. It's the, it's the personification of of, of evil and all that opposes God. And there is going to be this generation's long battle between good and evil, but in the end, the serpent's going to lose. And even though they have disobeyed God, God is not going to destroy his people. Instead, he will save them through this son of woman who is coming, who is going to crush the head of the serpent, even though it will cost him Dearly. 
Genesis 3.15 promises that, that God is going to send a Savior who will overcome evil and, and rescue um, God's fallen people. Adam and Eve needed that salvation, right? The, the best that they could do was come up with, you know, fig leaf coverings for themselves. God, though, would cover their sin and their shame and bring them back into relationship with him. That's how it all began. Sin entered the world and corrupted humanity, and, and the relationship between God and man was broken. And yet, even still, there was hope that God would redeem his fallen people. That's how it started. How's it going? Uh, well, none of us was in the garden, um, but we certainly act <laughs> like it. You know, we um, have all gone our own way. Romans 5.12 was right. Remember the fall voice over sin entered the world through one man and death through sin because all have sinned. Sin came into the world through Adam and Eve and we have all followed in their, their footsteps. We have all sinned. We've all turned away from God's way and, and said we'll do it our own way. Which means that Adam and Eve are, are you and me. And we need the Lord's salvation. Adam and Eve are you and me, and, and we need God's salvation. Adam and Eve are, are you and me. You know, we weren't there in the garden, and we are not accountable for their sin, but we are accountable for what we do, and we have all done an Adam and Eve. We have all put God's will uh, into the background and put our own will first. We've all asked ourselves, is God trustworthy enough to do what he says to do or not? Do I really need to listen to him when he says that this or that thing is or is not morally good? And, and even if we don't consciously think about it, we have certainly acted that way. You know, we're so good at justifying ourselves and papering over the tension in our consciences. But that puts us in, under the same curse as Adam and Eve. Romans 5.19 says, because of Adam's disobedience, we have all become sinners. And back it up one verse, Romans 5.18, Adam's sin means condemnation for all because we have all followed in that first sinner's footsteps. We are all separated from God, just as Adam and Eve were, with eternal consequences. You and me are Adam and Eve. We need the Lord's salvation. We can try to cover our sin. We can try to hide in the bushes. Um, but fig leaves aren't going to last forever. And God sees through bushes. If we want the blessing of life instead of the curse of death, then we need God's salvation. And thankfully, God is, is good to his word. Right? He kept the promise of the proto-good news. And he came in the person of his son, born of a woman, to redeem us from the curse. You know, the powers of evil did what they could to strike at his heel and take him down but the best they could do was kill him on the cross. He died and then rendered their best weapon useless by coming to life again. They struck at his heel, but he crushed their head. And he offered us forgiveness. Instead of forcing us to repay the debt, Jesus came and simply says, receive my grace. You know, I've been alluding here to Romans 5 to say what happened at the fall, but I've only been telling you half of the story. And Romans, tell, Romans 5 tells us not only what happened when Adam sinned, but it also tells us what happened when Jesus died to make things right. You might want to go there, Romans 5. Romans 5, starting in verse 15, says, The gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by grace of the one man Jesus overflow to the many? Right? Adam's sin brought death, but Jesus' death brings grace. 
Again, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. That is, Adam sinned and brought condemnation. After all the sin that we did, Jesus' gift brings justification. He makes us right with God. Verse 17, For if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Even though Adam's sin means death for all, Jesus' grace means life forever. What Adam upset, what Adam and Eve made upset, Jesus made right. Disobedience and sin leads to judgment and death, but Jesus is the way to righteousness and salvation. Adam and Eve are, are you and me. If we continue to walk in their footsteps, it leads only to condemnation and death. But Jesus calls us to leave that old way of life, to leave the sin behind, to walk with him in eternity. We need the Lord's salvation. You know, as verse 17 says, if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus? When we confess our sin and receive that abundant provision of grace, we are forgiven. We are restored, saved, renewed, brought back into relationship with God. Every sinful thought, every evil deed that we have done or will do is deleted from our account. It is paid for in full, forgiven by the blood of Jesus. Though our sin be great, his mercy is more. God is willing to make us right with him. Adam and Eve are you and me. We need the Lord's salvation. Now there's a reason that we are celebrating communion today because communion is a very tangible way of receiving that abundant provision of grace. Right? When we take the bread and the cup, we are confessing our sin. We are confessing our need for God and, and taking hold of the blessings that Jesus secured for us. If you are a follower of Jesus, then let the bread and the cup be a fresh reminder to you of the way that Jesus wiped away the effects of the fall or the, the, the sin of the fall and the, the price of the fall. The story of your life is no longer your sin. It is the salvation of God. And if you've never really considered whether or not you're accountable to God, think about Genesis 3, Romans 5. Let that shape your thinking. I mean, we're all Adam and Eve. We've all lived out their rejection of God. We've all said, God, we know better than you what's right. I will, tell you, I will tell you, God, what is right and what's wrong, rather than um, letting him be God. But he created us, and he sustains us, and he has come to earth to make things right. Don't, don't hide in the bushes, hoping that God won't be able to see you there. Come right into the open. Be transparent before God. Receive his abundant provision of grace. Let's pray as we prepare our hearts for communion. Lord, we, we confess to you that, that we are like Adam and Eve. We enjoy your provision. We receive your goodness and yet we would rather listen to our own hearts than to you. And that separates from us from you. And being separated from the source of life is not a good thing. But Jesus, you came. <laughs> Just as Adam's sin made us sinners, 
your obedience makes us right with you. Jesus, we receive your, your grace, your gift. We, we look to you with faith that we might live. We thank you for wiping away our sin. We thank you for renewing us and giving us a new mission to, to live not with the consequences of the fall, but to live the life of salvation that you have given us in the community around us. Thank you for your grace, Lord. If there's anybody here who's struggling with the weight of, of sin, the knowledge that they've you know, done something wrong and, and, and they've disappointed you in some way, God, I pray that you would lift that from them. Let them look upon the crucified Savior rising again, saying, your sins are forgiven, they are paid for. Thank you for your grace to us, Lord. And I pray that as we turn our hearts to communion, you would tune our hearts to sing your praise, to honor you with all that we are. We pray in Jesus' name. You know, all of this began with, uh, with a question to Adam and Eve. Does, does God really care about you? Is he really looking out for your best interests? Are his purposes and commands really something good, or is he holding something back to you, uh, from you? Adam and Eve entertained those thoughts, and look where it got them. The Lord's Supper, though, communion should set those questions to rest. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were still separated from him, Christ died for us. While we were still separated from him, not interested in him in the least, he laid down his life for us. That gives lie to the serpent's questions. Does God really care for you? Of course he did. He died to forgive your sin. Is he really looking out for your best interests? You bet he laid down his life to make sure that you would live eternally. Are God's purposes really good? Is he holding something back from me? Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he also, uh, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? God is good. His commands are good. His salvation is good. Receive his goodness at the table today.